I'm Jamil Jaffer. I'm a lawyer for the ACLU. And I'm up here with uh, Bill Binney, Alex Abdo, and Jim Bamford, who I will introduce uh, more fully in just a second. Um, I'm not sure how many of you got a chance to hear uh, Keith Alexander yesterday, the head of the NSA, uh, talk about the NSA's activities. Uh, I wasn't there myself, but I, I have heard that he offered a few reassurances. Um, <laughs> one of them, apparently, was that uh, the NSA is not, in fact, keeping a file on every American. Um, the <laughs> I'm just reporting, all right? The, 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 second, the second reassurance he offered is that when the NSA incidentally or inadvertently collects information about <laughs> Americans, uh, it's required by law to minimize that information, meaning it's required by law to delete it or to redact it. And the third thing he said is that the NSA's activities, and I think this is in some ways the most reassuring thing, uh, the NSA's activities are fully consistent with the Constitution and with the, and with the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which is the statute that governs the NSA's activities inside the United States. So uh, the question I want to ask is, you know, why, why is it that, that the head of the NSA feels obliged to offer those kinds of reassurances right now? I think there are a few reasons. One reason is that the NSA just has much, much more power today than it has ever before. Um, that's because of technological advances. Uh, it's also because of social behavior. We just share a lot more information electronically than we have in the past. Uh, and it's also, uh, and this is perhaps less known, because the law is so much weaker now than it was even 10 years ago. <laughs> Over the last decade, the, 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 the laws that govern the NSA's activities have been weakened repeatedly uh, in 2001, in 2005, in 2008. Uh, and as a result, the NSA really operates without a leash right now. Um, the, the people that I'm up here with today are perhaps the, the, the best people in the country to explain precisely what that means. Uh, one of them is Bill Binney, who was with the NSA for more than 30 years. Uh, he left the NSA in October of 2001. Uh, when he was at the NSA, he was working on uh, the very issues that we'll be talking about today. Uh, Alex Abdo, next to him, uh, is a colleague of mine at the ACLU. He's a staff attorney. He works on surveillance issues, especially in the national security context, uh, including a case that's before the Supreme Court right now uh, involving a challenge to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. And then Jim Bamford, uh, who many of you uh, already know, uh, is the nation's leading expert on the NSA. He's written many books about it, many articles about it. Among his books are uh, The Puzzle Palace, The Shadow Factory, uh, and Body of Secrets. So um, with that brief introduction, let me ask Jim first. Um, putting aside the legal issues, putting aside you know, the legal restraints on the NSA, uh, what is it that the NSA can do right now? What, it, what is it that the NSA is technologically capable of doing? Uh, and how is that different from what the NSA was technologically capable of doing, uh, say, 10 years ago? Well, first, I just want to say I'm really happy to be, oh, be here. And uh, I was here 10 years ago, and it's really grown. Uh, DEFCON's really grown since then, so I'm really happy to see that. Now, the other thing is uh, General Alexander uh, asked me to fill in a few blanks that he left when he was speaking here. And I said, I'd be very happy to do that since I've been talking about NSA since he was a private, I think. Um, and don't be fooled by that black t-shirt he was wearing. Uh, underneath it is a giant parabolic microphone. <laughs> so um, what can NSA do today that it couldn't do 10 years ago? Well, first of all, Pre-9-11, pre NSA was following the law to a large degree, uh, basically since the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act was passed back uh, around 1978. Uh, but that all changed after 9-11, and that's when uh, George Bush decided to do the warrantless eavesdropping. So since then, NSA has had an enormous building boom, like nothing in its history. 
billions and billions of dollars of uh, new buildings, new infrastructure, new listening posts, uh, build a new listening posts, uh, in, uh, or some of these are, are reconstruction of existing uh, listing posts, but a giant listing post, actually largest in the world, in, uh, in Atlanta, or outside of uh, uh, Augusta, Georgia. Um, it'll have 4,000 positions, 4,000 uh, eavesdropping positions. And another one in Texas, and then there's a downlink in, uh, in Colorado for NSA's uh, satellite information, and then another one in, in, um, in Hawaii. But the, uh, the high point of NSA's building boom is a building I just wrote about in the uh, April issue of Wired Magazine. It was a cover story in Wired Magazine on NSA's uh, enormous data center in, uh, in Utah, Bluffdale, U Utah. Uh, ironically, the only other thing in Bluffdale, Utah, is the uh, second largest polygamy uh, sect in, in the United States. So you got both groups there listening for messages from the heavens. Uh, <laughs> so it'd be interesting to watch these two groups uh, socialize together. Um, but uh, NSA is building this huge data center now in Utah that'll be a million square feet. Um, and cost two billion dollars so they can store, it'll be the central place for storage for virtually all the information that they uh, collect. It's basically going to be their, their cloud so that all the listing posts, all the analytical positions, the headquarters and so forth will be able to go in and come out, take stuff in, pull stuff out, analyze it from their uh, distant locations. And the other thing is this huge um, um, supercomputer center they're building down in um, Utah, I mean, uh, down in Tennessee, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, the place, uh, secret city, where they uh, worked on the atomic bomb in, in, uh, in World War II, and now they're working on a, basically the computer equivalent of the atomic bomb, a uh, computer that is into the petaflops in terms of speed now, and uh, they're building another building down there now that will be able to get into the exaflops, which... Uh, I've got a statistic here. I'll read later on how fast that really is, but it's very fast. And then maybe on to Yoda flops or whatever. Um, so that's pretty much where NSA is right now. It's this enormous building boom. They've got enormous storage capacity for all the new communications they're going to be intercepting and, and a new uh, supercomputer center for attacking uh, encryption, uh, maybe even... Uh, um, uh, public key encryption or other kinds of encryption, although it's hard to say exactly what they're going to be using that uh, center down in Tennessee for right now. So, so, Bill, how do you reconcile, is there some way to reconcile General Alexander's statement that the NSA isn't keeping track of every American with the existence of a facility like the one in Utah? Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to say, first of all, that uh, his statement about not keeping track of every American is absolutely true. He missed a few. Not many, but he missed a few. Okay? But, but that's the kind of word game they play. I've been in that business for a long time, so I knew their word game, so. But uh, no, <clears throat> there's absolutely no excuse for him, him even implying that he's not collecting all this data. I mean, it's not just for processing after <clears throat> linear recursives or things like that. It's, uh, it's actually storing information that's, that they're collecting, which is emails, FTPs, those kinds of things, Twitter things, and all kinds of data about everybody. And what they're doing then with that is, of course, indexing it in, uh, in a B plus tree kind of index where they take attributes where that describes the communicants involved and, uh, or it labels you. And then you build uh, social networks for everybody out of that by <clears throat> doing indexing with B plus trees. And there's virtually no limit that I know of that you can do in indexing that way. You can do trillions of relationships and still be able to manage it um, <clears throat> on, a, on a very large scale, including interrogating into that base to do, make decisions against flowing data that you're looking at, like uh, terabytes of data flowing by. But the problem is, uh, unless you know what to do to begin with, you can't tell the program how to execute the rules or what to make decisions to make at every step along the way. And that's really where they have a problem. Uh, it is in the ability to automate analysis of large data sets and large sets of information to make decisions as that data is passing by. 
or to go into large bases that they've stored, like they will be storing in Utah, but they have other storage facilities too. I mean, Utah is, uh, <clears throat> could probably store, a, uh, a, 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 I did some calculations on it, I didn't include this in the EFF uh, uh, article that I, or the affidavit that I signed earlier, but uh, if, you, if you looked at it, um, even if you take the current capabilities that's being advertised online at cleversafe.com, they have uh, <clears throat> 10 exabytes of storage that they can put into 21 racks of equipment that occupies 200 square feet of space. Well, if you take the 100,000 square feet, they're gonna have at Bluffdale and divide it by 200 and then multiply that by 10, you get 5,000 exabytes that they can store there. Well, I mean, that's a, uh, I mean, it, in order, if you had 100 years of communications of everybody stored there, to maintain 100 years, that is replacing every year, you're collecting a year, a year falls off the end, you know, you keep the latest 100 years online in Bluffdale, it would take 1,250 NARIS devices to do that. Now that's, uh, a NARIS device will do 10 gigabits a second, which means it could process and produce uh, uh, output and give you a display of, say, a million and a quarter, 1,000 character emails a second. So we'll take 1,250 of them running full time, all the time, to keep that last 100 years online. So that's an awful lot of processing just to fill that one storage site. That is not the only storage site they have, by, any way, by, any, by the way. They have a lot of others that's just planned to take the overflow that's coming out the next year or so. So, so up till then, I, I, see, I don't see, <clears throat> I see him saying things that are uh, verbally or by the word are correct but he's missing the basic, uh, th uh, you know, the reason I left NSA was because they started st spying on everybody in the country. That's the reason I left. Okay. <clears throat> NSA's charter, and it was a legitimate one, was to do foreign intelligence, and I was with that all the way, and I did the best I could in that job. Unfortunately, they took those programs that I built and turned them on you, and I'm, I'm sorry for that. I didn't intend that, but they did that. So, Al so. Alex, is this, um, is this a problem with the law? Is the problem that the law is not sufficiently restrictive, or is the problem that the NSA is violating the law? I think it's quite clearly both. Uh, you know, after 9-11, uh, we saw excesses of the Bush administration that we never would have guessed would happen. We saw uh, the executive simply ignoring statutes, uh, engaging in warrantless surveillance. And you know, for the centuries before that, the key protection of the Constitution was that when the government wants to surveil Americans, it do so with judicial approval after making its case to a court. Uh, and that was abandoned by the Bush administration. Um, but, but that was just you know, one instance of extreme violation of the law, but then Congress <coughs> essentially codified that in two, 2008 when it authorized the government to engage in domestic uh, dragnet surveillance of Americans' international communications. And so what we have now is an institutionalization uh, of the law breaking that occurred after 9-11, with the result being that the, the key legal protection that has protected us since uh, the enactment of the Bill of Rights is no longer in place with respect to our communication. So we, we can't be sure um, you know, that, that the law is protecting us. We can be quite sure actually that it's not protecting us. But, but even uh, putting aside what happened after 9-11 uh, with the violations that are now well known and exposed, there have been countless others that we don't know about. We know we have hints and suggestions from documents that we've gotten through FOIA, through leaks to the press, through the great work of, of Jim and through what we've learned from Bill and a few of his other colleagues at the NSA who defected, uh, we know that there have been other violations, but what you didn't hear in General Alexander's speech is any explanation of those, any, uh, any provision of the transparency that is so sorely needed. Uh, we have those hints in the documents and when we have uh, even a new one coming out of Congress just a week ago about uh, the NSA violating the Constitution and its use of its latest surveillance authority, but we don't know in what ways exactly. We don't know how often and we don't know with what effect. You know, the, 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 if you're a lawyer and you work on these kinds of issues, the, the difficult thing here is you've got this set of laws, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act principally, that lay out what seem like pl pretty clear restrictions on what the NSA can do. Uh, for example, the, the, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act says that in most instances when, when the NSA wants to 
essentially wiretap somebody inside the country, they need to get something called foreign intelligence probable cause, some version of probable cause. But what you guys are describing, Jim and Bill, and what is you know, described in a lot of newspaper articles that have come out over the last few years, is something that seems wholly inconsistent with those restrictions. And I'm trying to figure out, is that just because the NSA doesn't care at all about the law, or is it because the <coughs> NSA um, can manipulate laws that are poorly understood by the public? Uh, is it that they're playing word games? Is it some combination of all of these things? Because what you're describing really is hard to reconcile with the laws as the laws are generally understood by the lawyers who work with them. Well, one, uh, I think I'm noticing, looking at a lot of documents I've gotten from the Freedom Information Act and so forth and writing about NSA, I mean, there's several sets of laws. There's the FISA Act, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, and there's the FISA Amendments Act. Um, but then there's another thing. That's just the congressional... That's a statute. Um, then there's an implementing, um, uh, a set of implementing instructions, and they're known as uh, UCID 18, United States Signals Intelligence Directive 18, which is top secret with about a dozen code words after it. Um, and, and that sets out different, uh, um, for, for example, sets out different definitions from what most people are familiar with. Uh, most people are familiar with the Webster's definition of intercept. Um, so if you're speaking, if General Alexander is speaking about intercept, you have your own impression of what that word means from your history and from reading uh, uh, dictionaries definition. But uh, the uh, UCID 18 has a different definition, and that's uh, an intercept doesn't take place until it's actually listened to, until somebody puts on on some earphones or actually read some text on a screen. So you can pull in all the communications you want, store it in, in, a, in a media, and store it for as long as you want in, um, in Bluffdale, for example, in Utah. So there's these definitional differences between um, what civilians talk about and what NSA talks about, and then there's different sets of laws and regulations, and most of which are top secret. So um, that's sort of this mist that you have to look through, this fog you have to look through when you're dealing with uh, the legal issues with NSA. Well, as far as I could see, uh, the real plan here was to spy on Americans, because it, start, it, wasn't, it didn't start in October of 2001. It actually started in before that in February when, when certain people like three-star generals from NSA went around asking different telecoms to provide them customer data. That happened in February of 2001. So that to me implied the plan was to spy on Americans from the beginning. Because at that point, uh, that was three months after they were doing that, three months after we had put our system together where it worked all the way to the end and you could manage graphing huge numbers of things. Uh, trillions of things. So once we had shown that we were connected all the way, three months later they went around asking for this data to spy on every American. So that to me seemed to be the intent from the beginning. But we didn't openly say that. Mm -hmm. Okay. But they were going around asking for the data to make that happen. And then 9-11 uh, came along and that was a good excuse to execute. Okay. At that point the execution started. So, and, and there is another real problem. Uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, the software will, once it takes in data, it will build profiles on everybody in that data. And if you want that profile, you can simply call it up by the attributes of anyone you want. So in other words, the process does so much analysis already, and it's in place for people to look at if they want to do it, but what they're trying to do now is they realize they have too much data, so they have to automate that process too. So that's what the big data initiative is really all about. The, out of the White House, the recent initiative uh, is to try to get automated processes to go through that because they can't hire enough people to do it. There's just too much data, okay? So that's not possible. So they've got to get an automated process doing that. And this to me was the intent from the beginning, and to do that inside this country. It was obvious from what they're doing, the sequence that they were doing, that that was the case. And law, they didn't pay any attention to. 
So just to, to channel General Alexander again, you know, the, the, the law requires the government to minimize data about Americans once it's acquired it. So why isn't that a sufficient protection? Why, isn't, why shouldn't we be reassured by General Alexander's uh, statement that minimization requirements protect Americans from precisely what you're complaining about now? Uh, be because all the oversight is totally dependent on what NSA tells them. They have no way of knowing what they're really doing unless they're told. So, <clears throat> plus I would add a simple little point. Uh, we put in uh, 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 protections for U.S. citizens by doing uh, a unique anonymization that would, we would encrypt attributes of U.S. citizens so you couldn't tell who you were looking at, even if you had it in your base. So, uh, but you have to ask yourself, how could I do that from the, how could I do that with the databases they have, unless it was in, already there, in the clear, and I, so I could encrypt it. Alex, I know that, that you know, one of the complaints you have sometimes made about um, the existing FISA is the weakness of the minimization requirements. Yes. Um, you want to say a little bit about that? Sure. You know, the legal problem with the minimization requirement is just that it, it has a gaping hole which swallows the rule, which is that uh, if the information is essentially what the NSA wants anyway, if it pertains to foreign intelligence, which is defined extremely broadly, then the NSA doesn't have to get rid of that information. They can continue to keep it in their database. But we've, we've learned something else actually quite interesting in the past few weeks from a few senators who have been very vocal in their uh, objections to reauthorizing the latest surveillance statute at the end of the year, which is that even uh, uh, supposing they have information in their, in their database that they're not supposed to or not supposed to target from the outset, um, they can then keep it in their database and target after the fact by going back and conducting data mining searches afterward, in other words, to get the information that they couldn't target from the outset. And it sounds like a minor loophole, uh, but it's one that a few senators think is the key to the entire program. That the NSA isn't concerned so much with using its authorities to target foreigners, but that they're using it as an excuse to accumulate masses of, inform of information that they can then later search uh, under the legal theory that uh, Jim laid out, that uh, the search doesn't happen until uh, they run the query later on. It, it's not, the, the acquisition isn't the search, uh, the querying later on is the search. Uh, so, and, and of course, what's troubling about all this aside from what's obvious is that the secrecy that pervades the program makes it impossible to know whether any of these speculations are uh, true. We obviously have the experience uh, of Bill and Jim to flesh out these theories. Uh, but so little is really known about how the NSA actually interprets its statute, how it interprets its authority, and, uh, and how it's using those authorities. One thing is, the, the, in terms of the uh, internal controls, there's really two. One is the general counsel's office, and the other is the inspector general's office. And just to give you an example of how effective those organizations are, uh, during the period of the warrantless eavesdropping, during the, uh, during the, the Bush uh, period, um, when it was decided that we were going to go into warrantless eavesdropping, when uh, it was decided by the administration that the NSA was going to do warrantless eavesdropping, um, they refused to allow the general counsel's office or the inspector general's office to look at the legal justification for doing this, even though at one point, a couple of times, NSA said uh, we'd like to see what the legal authority is for us doing this, um, the uh, Bush Justice Department said you're not cleared to know the reasons that uh, you have to do this. And uh, uh, General Hayden at the time just saluted smartly and turned on the bugs. So. Uh, um, you know, you have to really wonder what the usefulnesses of uh, some of these internal organizations are. If somebody from the higher up in the administration could just say, it's not your, none of your business and you're not cleared to know. What uh, is there? Uh, why, why do they want to do it? Why does the... You. Why do they want to do it? Why do they want to surveil? That's their job. That's what they do. That's what they were born to do, and that's what they like doing. They, that's their job. They surveil um, um, 
the eavesdropping is what, what they're charged to do. And uh, you don't see very many people, except for Bill, there were only uh, Bill, yeah. a couple of other people associated with Bill that actually said, wait a minute, I'm not going to do this. Um, um, I, I'm opting out. You know, it's time for me to uh, look at the agency from the outside in. Um, so basically, uh, wh whatever people at NSA are told to do, they do. Um, so you have that period during the warrantless eavesdropping where, uh, uh, now not everybody at NSA knew that they were involved in warrantless eavesdropping. I should make that clear. That was a very compartmented program. Uh, but after it was revealed, there were very few people that objected and left the agency. So NSA's job is eavesdropping. Their original charter is eavesdropping on, on foreign countries and, and uh, you know, foreign people in foreign countries, which there is no legal problem with because uh, they don't have any constitutional protections. Um, the problem is uh, when NSA is told to uh, eavesdrop domestically, and this wasn't the first time. Nixon, uh, during his time, uh, told NSA to start eavesdropping domestically, and it did it for about a week. And NSA was very happy. They were overjoyed that they were be being given that opportunity to eavesdrop domestically um, on anti-war protesters. And it, it only stopped because this big civil, civil uh, libertarian named Jager Hoover came in and said, uh, uh, I'm going to blow the whistle if NSA keeps doing this. So he told that to Nixon. Uh, primarily because uh, he saw NSA as stepping on FBI's uh, turf. Yep. And so a week later, uh, uh, Nixon canceled the program. But um, there's a willingness at NSA, there was a willingness then, there was a willingness uh, during the Bush administration to salute smartly and say, uh, you know, turn on the microphones uh, when uh, they're ordered to do that by senior officials in the uh, administration. You know, I just want to say something about the distinction between targeting people inside the United States and, and targeting people outside because, you know, it's true that there is this sort of, you know, obvious distinction between those two categories of surveillance. But one of the things that's going on now is that the NSA is, uh, it's engaged in dragnet surveillance of people outside the country. And they say that they can do this because those people outside the country don't have constitutional rights to assert. The problem is, from a constitutional perspective, the problem is that when they are surveilling those people outside the country, often those people outside the country are communicating with people inside the country. And so the NSA is sweeping up these huge volumes of communications between Americans inside the United States and non-Americans outside the United States. And those huge volumes of communications are going into these databases, including these, these Utah databases, and the, the problem that Alex was alluding to that Senator Wyden has been harping on for the last few weeks uh, is that once all the information has been collected on the theory that it was collected in the course of surveillance of people abroad who don't have constitutional rights, all of that information sits in a database here and then can be searched even if the NSA is concerned not about some foreigner living abroad but about some American living here. Um, and from, you know, you, there are lots of reasons to be worried about NSA surveillance, even of non-Americans living abroad. But, you know, even if your only concern is about NSA surveillance of Americans inside the United States, this is, as Alex says, you know, a, a really huge loophole uh, in, the, in the legal protections. So one other point also is that the, um, when you're thinking of targeting overseas and not targeting U.S. citizens, it sounds fairly innocent, but uh, one thing you can target, for example, would be the overseas uh, data or, or call centers. Uh, you know, all these uh, call centers they have in India and Philippines and different places now, all these uh, companies from a uh, uh, AT&T to um, uh, American Express, uh, Bank of America, all these companies are outsourcing their um, their, uh, uh, when people call up and want to know what their balance is in their, in their uh, banking account, for example, it might be answered by a calling center in India. Well, you can target the calling center in India because it's a, it's a center outside the United States. It's uh, foreigners that run it outside the United States. And you're not specifically targeting any American within that call center. But everything going in, if I call up and say, what's the balance in my banking account or uh, a question about uh, 
some finan financing uh, that I'm doing. Uh, that's picked up um, and would also go to Bluffdale because it's not being specifically targeted against me, but it's being targeted against an overseas call center. So that's sort of a, a loophole. <laughs> So I, I want to ask the, the question that, that we started to talk about a minute ago, uh, but ask it more directly. So why, why aren't more, you know, if this kind of thing is going on at the NSA, why aren't more people speaking out about it? Uh, well, I think the, 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 the point is they're, they're, they're all been pretty much uh, scared by what, what they did to us. They threatened us with prosecution. They tried to prosecute Tom Drake, and, and they basically made our lives a mess. They... Uh, they made us incapable of getting business, so, so, um, so, but that kind of thing is the power that they have. They can harass you in many different ways. And so they tried doing that with us. And so every, and they advertised that, by the way, internally in NSA on their internet inside the NSA. It was, they put our 60 minutes take on, on their, on their video internally. They, and they made it clear what they were doing to us internally. So uh, the whole idea was to scare the entire population internally. And that's really what's happening with our government, the way I see it. <clears throat> you know, Ronald Reagan said, we're a country with a government. I think we're reversing that relationship. Our country is now thinking, it, our government now thinks it has a country. And the only way to maintain it. <laughs> yeah. But, but see, the only way to really maintain that is to do like all these other totalitarian states have done around the world. You have to gather information about your population so you can control it. And that's really what's driving all of this. They're afraid of the population of the United States. They want, they want a country, this country. That's really, in my view, what they're doing and why. So, I had this. <laughs> All right. I want, I want to save a little time for questions, but I have uh, yeah. at least one more question. This one for you, Alex. Um, I mentioned at the beginning that there's a case before the Supreme Court uh, this fall. What's at stake in that, in that case? So this is our, the ACLU's lawsuit on behalf of a number of, of uh, uh, human rights groups, journalists, activists, challenging the latest surveillance statute, the, the statute in 2008 that really shifted the paradigm from individualized surveillance to dragnet surveillance. And unfortunately, for the past four years, we haven't been uh, litigating in court about whether the law is constitutional or not. We've been litigating about whether our <laughs> plaintiffs have standing to challenge the law, whether they uh, can file the lawsuit to begin with. And what's discouraging about uh, the suit is that the government's argument all along has been our plaintiffs can't sue because they can't prove that they were surveilled. But of course, we, the NSA, would never disclose whether anyone in particular is surveilled. And the consequences of that argument should be obvious. They're that uh, no one can challenge the law. So even if you're not concerned about the extent of the NSA's authorities, you should, I, I think, perhaps be concerned that not even the government wants there to be constitutional review of these laws. They don't want anyone in court discussing them, let alone uh, in public or in Congress. They don't want courts reviewing these laws to establish meaningful limits if there are limits to establish, or even to say uh, if the government is correct and the laws are constitutional which they're not. Uh, so that's what's at stake in, in, in this lawsuit is whether this statute can be challenged, but it's not just this statute. There are numerous surveillance authorities that not only the NSA has, but other agencies use on a daily basis uh, to intercept our communications or to gather intelligence. Uh, and if this suit uh, is turned away by the Supreme Court, then I, I worry that there'll be little opportunity to uh, flesh out the constitutionality or the limits of the law in this area. And without those limits, we know what happens. Uh, and if not for, you know, a few uh, in intrepid uh, whistleblowers, we wouldn't know about what happened after 9-11. That wasn't the success of the rule of law in this country. That wasn't the result of a lawsuit that brought that about. Uh, that, was, uh, that was luck. And we, we can't rely on that forever. Uh, we're a system of checks and balances for a reason, but, but those uh, checks and balances are not working in this area. Go ahead. Uh, just one point also, I was uh, actually uh, one of the plaintiffs along with Christopher Hitchens and a few other people of the original suit 
dropped by uh, ACLU, and um, we were uh, among the uh, uh, people that was identified as uh, not being able to show that we have standing. We weren't able to show that we were physically eavesdropped on because NSA doesn't tell you who it eavesdrops on, so they threw our case out. And that's what this case is uh, going forward with now, which I'm very happy about. The, the problem with the case, however, is that uh, even if the case uh, is successful in the Supreme Court, the government has this, uh, this uh, ultimate way to turn the switch and, and end the case. It's called the State Secrets Act, which is used a number of times against cases where it, it looks like it's either going to lose or it may um, um, end up exposing government secrets. Uh, and that's one of the problems you have here, is that even if um, the courts accept the argument and find in favor of the ACLU, the, uh, the problem is that at one point, at some point, the, uh, the government may flip the switch, turn the off switch uh, off, and uh, use the use its ultimate weapon, which is the State Secrets uh, uh, Act. Yeah, this is, this is maybe worth, worth underscoring. The, the, the secrecy surrounding all of this surveillance obviously prevents us from knowing the full extent to which the government is spying on Americans. Uh, you know, we don't know in what instances and in what context they are uh, getting location information, for example. We don't know who, in what context specifically um, they are getting content information from emails. And we don't know uh, in what context they get purely domestic telephone calls. Um, so all of this is shrouded in, in, in secrecy. But, but perhaps even more troubling than that is that the secrecy insulates all of these surveillance powers from judicial oversight. So you've got all of these statutes that, that look like uh, laws in the sense that they are enacted by Congress and nominally subject to constitutional limits. But it's literally, or has been, literally impossible to enforce those constitutional limits uh, because the government has all of these procedural objections that have in many cases been <coughs> successful. One of them is standing, the one that Alex was talking about, and another is state secrets, the one that Jim was talking about. Um, so if you by have, way, the, it, what, I mentioned State Secrets Act. That was a mistake. It's not, it's not an act. It's called the State Secrets Privilege because there's never been anything enacted allowing them to do it. They just do it and get away with it. So they don't have any basis in law for that, for that privilege. If you have questions, just come up to the mic up here. Uh, yeah, it's uh, Kim Zetter with Wired. I have a question about uh, Alexander State Minister, if you can clarify. He said that... Uh, uh, let's see. He, when talking about the minimization, he said that uh, minimization means, which means nobody else can see it unless there's a crime that's been committed. That to me sounds like we're not talking about national security. I, I couldn't really. It, hear what's the legal it, basis sure. for that? So, so the question was, <coughs> does minimization mean that you that the NSA can't look at the communications unless there's evidence of a crime? And that's that's simply not true. That's not what the requirement is. You can you can go and read it. Uh, if you want, come up. I'll send you the link to it later. Uh, the requirement, that's one of the problems with the dragnet surveillance since 2008 is that it doesn't have to be tied to wrongdoing. It just has to be tied to foreign intelligence, which can mean a lot of things. It can mean uh, a human rights advocate talking to an embassy abroad. Uh, it can mean any, any, anything relating to the foreign affairs. But is there a legal basis for collecting data under national security reasons and then seeing criminal activity in it for use domestic prosecution. Is there a, is there a legal, what's the legal basis for that? Because that's what it sounds like he's talking about here. It doesn't sound like he's talking about national security. I think what he's saying is, is that once we've collected something for, for foreign intelligence reasons, we can use it to prosecute people for crimes. And that's certainly true. But it's also true that um, that, that they don't have to minimize information that falls into this very broad category of foreign intelligence information. Uh, and so whatever protections apply to, uh, you know, whatever minimization protections apply, it, it, that those protections don't apply to this very broad category of information about foreign affairs, about the economy, about national security, about terrorism. And if you're a human rights researcher, for example, in the United States and you're talking to 
um, uh, the victim of a, some human rights abuse abroad, then you can't be assured that your communication isn't being, lim isn't being listened to by the NSA. The law gives the NSA the authority to listen to that communication. And if General Alexander said something different yesterday, I think he misspoke. It's awfully generous of you, Jamil. Um, my question is for Bill and Jim, but anybody else can address it if, if you so desire. I'm often struck by how little anyone in Congress, really, besides Ron Wyden, is willing to challenge any of this. Um, there's n almost near you know, silence or agreement with the government's arguments about state secrets and, and you know, wiretapping and the FISA Amendments Act passed in 2008. Obama voted for it. Um, so my question is, you know, we, we talk a lot about surveillance in this world. We don't talk very much about blackmail, and I don't really get why, because it seems to me that, you know, there are 535 people in the House and the Senate who could affect some change in this regard, right? Ostensibly, they have power over the NSA, and they don't. And I'm wondering if there's any, you know, if, if there's anything you know about blackmail, frankly, that, you know, people are actually afraid to do the right thing because they too have emails and cell phones and, you know, personal lives that are potentially, you know, stuff that they don't want public. So, thanks. Let me take that. <clears throat> yeah. I think there's a couple of factors involved here. One is that the uh, NSA produces uh, an awful lot of intelligence for the U.S. government on a very large scale. Uh, most of it is coming from NSA, in fact, for all of the government. So they, they look at them as, a, as a, a source of input of intelligence and on decisions they may have to make. So, so they, value, they look at them as a valuable resource. But NSA also looks at Congress as a way of getting money, and they really um, they, they uh, <clears throat> focus in on preparing s stories, um, which I re refer to as technical, technical, techno babble. You know, they go down and bamboozle Congress, and the Congress can't challenge them because they don't know any better. Okay, you, you have a con congressional people down there who, who don't know what uh, what a not necessarily some of them don't even know what an email. Some of them still don't email. You know, so <laughs> so they aren't they aren't technically swift. Okay, so these guys go down there and bamboozle them. Uh, and you can see some of that in that uh, testimony that happens in the various committees there. You can see that. So they get bamboozled that way. But also, from the congressional perspective, they look at NSA as the, all these different buildings they're putting around the country are going into somebody's area, right? And so there's money going there, and they, they have, that means that they're supporting their constituents, and therefore they, they feel they have to support them, and so they let them do basically what they they want them they want to, whatever they want to do. They say it's okay because <clears throat> there are intelligence resources in the in the government. So those are the kind of factors I think that are involved in that. Well, um, yeah, it, it's I agree with the with the uh, person who asked the question. It's changed a great deal from the beginning back in the mid '70s when you had the first. Uh, House and Senate Intelligence Committees. You had Frank Church, who was a very, uh, very much going after NSA. He had the first real hearings that, for the first time, exposed what NSA was uh, was doing, and it had been spying illegally for 30 years at that point. Uh, until uh, Frank Church and his uh, committee found out about it, that's what created the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Um, and what you ha and that was at the beginning. Now you have the opposite. At the beginning, they were watchdogs, and now they're lapdogs. Um, all they do is uh, salute smartly and do whatever uh, the intelligence community wants. Actually, they're they're gone beyond that now, where uh, uh, they actually suggest to the intelligence community that they should be doing more and so forth. And I think one of the reasons for that is that, uh, uh, especially post 9/11. Um, it's this whole idea in Congress that uh, your opponent the next time up is going to say you're weak on terrorism, you're weak on defense, you're weak on uh, U.S. security if you vote against anything uh, uh, that NSA wants or really that the Pentagon wants. So you've got that factor that the uh, Congress is very much afraid of consti uh, constituent uh, reaction if they um, look hostile to, uh, to anything that's uh, has the word terrorism in it. But there, there would be more Ron Wydens if the civil liberties constituency were louder. If, if more people wore Sue the Bastards t-shirts. Yep. Yeah. So. <laughs>
Hi, I'm uh, Cory Doctorow and, and I write about this stuff a lot and the question that occurred to me when you were speaking earlier is the one that someone shouted out from the audience, why? And the answer you gave made it sound like there's someone sort of at the, there's an upper echelon at the NSA who eavesdrop on people the way ants build hills, that it's just sort of a compulsion, like if they weren't doing this they'd be hand washing or something. And then it sounded like you said maybe no, the reason that they're doing this is that um, it's just a way of building an empire and if they could build an empire by pasteurizing milk they'd be out there pasteurizing milk instead of listening to people's conversations. None of those sound like a totally complete account of, of what their internal theory is of what happens when you harvest the entire communications corpus of a nation or a planet, is it, is it merely compulsion? Is it merely empire building? Do they have a theory about what they're going to get? And as a kind of uh, end to that, as a Canadian who lives in the United Kingdom, can someone explain to me why eavesdropping on me is okay but not okay for Americans and maybe explain how that ex relates to the answer to why people harvest all this communication on Americans? Uh, thank you. Yeah. First, first of all, there are treaties and, and with different between countries that we don't spy on each other's people. So, so, so that does. Those do exist. So, um, uh, I, I know it's hard to believe, but right now I don't think any any of that really applies. They just they're taking in everything without minimization. They don't minimize anything, as far as I know. Everything's being taken in, and it's, part of it's a fear. I think that they're afraid of not having the data so they couldn't figure out something out or if they pull all the data in eventually they'll figure something out and be able to go back and 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 resolve the issues in the you know in retrospect. Uh, so I think there's several drivers there. I don't but my real <clears throat> my real point is this is much larger. It has to do with a government that's virtually in, implanted in Washington. People don't get I mean this is why I'm for term limits, right? These people don't don't rotate, so they stick down there and they think they know better, okay? And so now we, that's why I said we, I think we have a government that thinks it has a country. But it, it's, it seems conceivable to me um, that, that, you know, with the right analytical tools, it's, it's true that if you collect more information, you're more likely to find something. But it's, you know, it's true in the same way that it's true that if you searched everybody's home inside the United States, you're like, you know, you would find more than you do right now. But ultimately, you know, there are value, there are trade-offs that we make. You know, we, we make decisions about the limits we want to place on government power because we want to be not just safe but also free. free. Yeah. And, um, you know, ultimately this question of would we be safer or, or safer or will we know more if they collect more information, you know, I think it's an interesting and useful question. I think people should ask that question, but it doesn't answer the ultimate question, which is do we want those policies? And that, to answer that question, you know, it's, that, it's not susceptible to an empirical study. It's, you know, you have to make value judgments. And, and uh, uh, you know, for the same reasons that we don't think it makes sense for the government to search everybody's home without a warrant, we don't think it makes sense for them to collect everybody's communications without a warrant. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to add just one thing there. Uh, technically, that is for all the programs that we had and everything we ever did, there was absolutely no reason to collect all U.S. citizens' communications at all. We could have determined all of the bad guys inside and outside this country without doing any of that. And we could have done it legitimately, legally, in conformance with FISA, the Constitution, and everything. But they chose to go down the dark side. Well, un un unfortunately, we're getting kicked out of this oh, room. Okay. But uh, we have another, um, we have a Q&A room. Uh, it's called Track 2 Q&A, and we'll be there for at least a few minutes right after this. Sorry, Jim. Okay, sure. <coughs> Thanks for coming.